me be still, though Satan is busy, God is real. To bridle my tongue, let my words edify, let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight. Take care of my thoughts both day and night. Order my steps in your word. Please order my steps brothers and sisters. This reading is going to be from 
2 Samuel 13, 1 to 22. David's son, Absalom, had a beautiful unmarried sister named Tamar. Amnon, another of David's sons, was in love with her. He was so much in love with her that he became sick. Because it seemed impossible for him to have her, as a virgin, she was kept away from meeting men. But he had a friend, a very shrewd man named Jonadab, the son of David's brother Shamiah. Jonadab said to Ammonon, you are the king's son, yet day after day I see you looking sad. What is the matter? I'm in love with Tamar, the sister of my brother, of my half-brother Absalom. He answered. Jonadab said to him, pretend that you are sick and go to bed. When your father comes to see you, you say to him, please ask my sister Tamar to come and feed me. I want her to fix the food where I can see, see her, and then serve it to me herself. So Amnon pretended that he was sick and went to bed. King David, when he, King David went to see him, and Amnon said to him, please let Tamar come and make a few cakes here where I can see her, and then serve them to me herself. So David sent word to Tamar in the palace, go to Amnon's house and fix him some food. She went there and found him in bed. She took some dough, prepared it, and made some cakes there where he could see her. Then, he, then she baked the cakes and emptied them out of the pan for him to eat. But he wouldn't. He said, send everyone away. And they all left. Then he said to her, bring the cakes here to my bed and serve them to me yourself. So she took the cakes and went over to him as she offered him, as she offered them to him, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me. No, she said, don't force me to do such a degrading thing. That's awful. How could I ever hold my head up in public again? And you, you would be completely disgraced in Israel. Please speak to the king, and I am sure he will give me to you. But he would not listen to her. And since he was stronger than she was, he overpowered her and raped her. Then Amnon was filled with a deep hatred for her. He hated her now even more than he loved her before. And he said to her, get out. No, she answered, I, to send me away like this is a greater crime than what you just did. But Amnon would not listen to her. He called in his personal servant and said, get this woman out of my sight, throw her out and locked the door. The servant put her out and locked the door. Tamar was wearing a long robe with full sleeves, the usual clothing for an unmarried princess in those days. She sprinkled ash on her head, 
tore her robe and with her hands buried in her with her hands buried in her hand with her head buried in her hands went away crying when her brother Absalom saw her he asked has Ab has Amnon molested you please sister don't let it upset you so much. He is your half-brother, so don't tell anyone about it. So Tamar lived in Absalom's house, sad and lonely. When King David heard what had happened, he was furious. And Absalom hated Amnon so much for having raped his sister Tamar that he would not, he would no longer ever speak to him. May the Lord have a blessing on the reading of his word. Let's just pause uh, for a moment of prayer. Father, thank you uh, for your goodness to us. And we just thank you for your word. As we open it, God, please speak to each heart. Lord, we know you sent your word for a purpose. And I pray that you may help your servant that I may declare your word courageously, boldly, and under the anointing of the Spirit of God. For Jesus' sake, amen. The family was making funeral arrangements for an elderly woman who had never been married. As they were going over the notes, because she had left some notes as to what should happen at her funeral service, as they were make, going over the notes, they found this little note from her. I want no male pallbearers. That's an unusual note. I want no male pallbearers. But she gave an explanation. They wouldn't take me out while I was alive, and I don't want them taking me out when I'm dead. <laughs> she was still clearly upset about her romantic life. The guys wouldn't take her out while she was alive, and she's not going to let them take her out now that she is dead. Today I want to speak primarily to those who are in a romance or are looking forward uh, to one. As we continue in our series, God's Design for Marriage. And as I shared with you last week, I believe that the Word of God is, re is relevant not only for those who we specifically speak to, but for everybody, I believe God has a message for everybody as we go along. But this morning, I'm speaking specifically to those who are in a relationship or who are looking forward to being in one. We're continuing on our series, God's Design for Marriage. And God's design for marriage begins long before two people stand at the altar. In fact, a big part of God's design, listen, listen good young people, and those of you who are single, a big part of God's design for marriage has to do with who you marry. And so today I want to speak to you on the theme, how to choose the right mate. You remember last week, one of the points we covered last week was the fact that God has given some the gift of singleness and he has given some the gift of marriage. And we've showed you some, some of the folks who should be cautious about getting married. But having heard all of that, some of you sat through that and you said, you know what happened? I think I have the gift of marriage. So this message is specially directed at those of you who are convinced that God has given you that gift of marriage. How to choose the right mate. And last week we had a hand, we had a, um, at the book table we had a number of, of pamphlets or brochures, 100 things to know when dating, and they all went like wildfire. So we have more this morning, and you can get them at the book, book card from uh, Brother Carson. One dollar, we have a new supply. Uh, this morning uh, for you 100 things to know when dating now let me tell you let me start by by advising you how not to choose how you don't go about it number one you don't choose on the spur of the moment 
I actually know this man. He was in church. There was a service going on. But he went to church uh, and just by himself. And there he was sitting on the pew. And he knelt down and he prayed. And he prayed for God to send him a wife. And he was in earnest prayer. And he woke up. And when he, not didn't wake up. He opened his eyes, finished praying. Some of us do fall asleep while we're praying. But, 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 but he opened his eyes. And there at the window was a young lady. And he went to her and said, will you marry me? And she said, yes. yes. <laughs> Whoa. Don't choose like that. Don't choose on the spur of the moment. But don't choose either solely based on good looks. Oh, I know looks, uh, I can't tell you don't because we do have eyes, amen. But don't choose based only on looks. So I read this story about a French man by the name of Jean Pocoran. And in the thir this is a 13th century story, and he was sentenced to death because he was a habitual thief. He kept stealing over and over and over. So they sentenced him to death. And so uh, they, they said if there was a maiden who was willing to marry him, he would be released. And guess what? A homely... This is not my description. This is how the story says it. A homely looking girl stepped forward, willing to marry him. He looked at the lady, shook his head, and said, no, I'd rather marry the gallows. <laughs> Hangman, do your duty. Listen, don't choose based only on looks. You'll make some bad decisions. The third, don't choose based only on love. Oh, I wish I had time to talk about this one, but I'm not going to talk about this. We don't know, we, well, well, in a sense, I will talk about it by giving you the message that we have. But don't choose solely on love. Some people think you should marry somebody just because you love them. You better not marry somebody just because you love them. Love is essential, but that's not enough of a reason. A few weeks ago, and this is another true story, a 35-year-old French woman was mar married a man she had loved for seven years. What was unusual about the marriage is that the man was not there. Only his picture was there. Guess why? He was dead. He had been killed in an auto accident 20 months earlier and she got presidential permission from the president of France to marry this dead man who she loved. She became a wife and a widow the same time. Carlton, you ever heard that one? She became a wife and a widow the same time. And you know what happens? If she meets another man she wants to marry him, she's going to have to get divorced. The only good thing, the divorce will be uncontested. <laughs> Love <laughs> is not enough. So how do you choose? Let's get right down to it. How do you choose? I'm going to suggest to you that you choose based on the four C's. Christianity, character, and I'll stop there so you don't start filling out ahead of time. Number one, Christianity. The person must be a Christian. Turn in your Bibles with me, please. Hold your Bible there in 2 Samuel because we're going to get back there eventually. But let's turn for the time being to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and 15 to a very well-known passage of Scripture. But you know, it is good for us to refresh our memories about these things. And folks, those of you who are parents, I hope that even though you're married already, you take some notes of what we're saying because some of these things we really need to share with our children. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 because I am finding out, listen, 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 I am finding out that Christian parents are not even sharing these principles with their children. And part of our responsibility as parents is is to instruct our children and as they approach marriage you cannot be disengaged 
you have got to be engaged in helping them to understand God's will and God's purpose for marriage. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and and Belial, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Now let me ask you this question. Do you know what a yoke is? You know, we, we, we sometimes rattle through the scripture, but I don't think we stop to just consider what is a yoke. Now a yoke is a frame that joins two animals together and the frame has two holes for the heads of the animals to go through. Usually it's oxen. And the two, there are these round holes, the ox puts through his head, the other one puts through his head, and then somehow they're able to tighten the whole thing so that the, oxes, the, the oxen's head cannot come out on its own. Do you know what that means? Do you believe one ox can be going that way and the other ox goes the other way? You see, somehow we get this idea that when I get, if I marry an unsafe person, it's okay because I can do my thing, my Christian thing, and he's going to do his unchristian thing, but it's going to be okay. You better believe that is wrong because what God is trying to help you to understand that when you get married, you are yoked together, and so the Bible says, do not be yoked with an unbeliever. Do not be, do not, because here's what God is trying to get across to you. If you marry an unbeliever, you both must be going in the same direction and your spiritual life is going to be affected. Do you get it? And God, God goes, goes, he goes even further. And he says some words to help us understand how serious it is. And he says, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? And he says, oh, what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony? Listen, my friend, I want you to realize that I'm talking to parents now. Because some of us are parents are too silent. Because we'll tell, we'll say, oh, it's a nice girl or it's a nice guy. God is not impressed. If the person doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, here is what God has to say. What harmony is there between Christ and Belial the devil? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And oh, I'm praying not only for my young friends and my older friends, but I'm challenging and praying for parents that we would be more proactive. Help our young people not make this mistake. This is 101 for God's purpose for marriage. 101, we must make sure the person is a Christian. Make sure the person is a for real Christian. You say, how do I know the person's for real, for real? One of the ways, <laughs> and I said this to you last week, it blows my mind. I, I, I meet so many young people and I ask them, they've been dating for six months and he, the guy, oh, he's so sweet, he's so, so wonderful. Is he a Christian? I'm not sure. <laughs> you, uh, Christian young person or older person, if you're single and you're in a dating relationship, you need to know for sure the person is a Christian. You say, how do I know for sure? You ask them. Is that a mind-blowing concept? <laughs> you ask them. You get their testimony. You find out how it is they got saved. How do they know for sure they're saved? And then you don't just ask them. You watch them. Amen. Watch them to make sure that there are real signs of life. That it was not breach birth. Amen. Make sure there are signs of spiritual life. Make sure it's a for real, for real, born again Christian. Amen. I have known too many cases where the last time, and this is particularly true of us men. You know, we, men sometimes, girls, let me give you a warning. Guys, 
like Christian girls. Did you know that? They'll slip in. Oh, 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 oh I love Jesus. <laughs> you better make sure that boy loves Jesus. <laughs> you know who, who real Jesus is. Because too often the last time we have seen that boy is the day of the wedding. We, ne we never seen him again since. And I'm saying to you, my friend, it will affect you whether you like it or not. Some girls will tell me, oh, but you know, oh, but you know, the unsaved boys are so much more gentlemanly than the Christian boys. They are such gentlemen. Listen, I don't know anything, whether it's true or not, and I'm not going to argue. But here's what I know. I hope you'll get this. If you marry an unsaved person, you're going to always have trouble with your father-in-law. I don't know if you got that one. You see, if you marry somebody who is a child of the devil, Satan is their father, you're going to always have trouble with your father-in-law. So if you're right here, listen, listen, listen. If some, there are some of you who that song this morning was relevant to you because if some of you are willing to do it God's way, you're going to end up breaking your relationship. There's somebody here, I believe, who is in a relationship that needs to end. Because you are in a relationship with somebody who doesn't know Jesus. So that song applies to you. Listen, even if your heart is broken because you want to follow Jesus, you can lift your hand and say, you'll make it. But my friend, if you're here this morning and you are, listen, if you're married to someone who is a Christian, might I suggest to you that you come to Jesus? I am guaranteeing you, sir, madam, if you're in a relationship, you're, if you're married to somebody, and, and this also goes if you're, not, if you're not married yet, but you're dating a Christian, I am going to suggest to you, come to Jesus. If you think you're going to make it, if you think the two of you are going to work out just fine, you are not going to work out just fine. And yet there is life in Jesus Christ. He is willing to offer you abundant life. Sir, madam, I don't care what your relationship is. If you come to Jesus, he is giving you life and life more abundantly. But secondly, secondly, we want to talk about character. The second C. Somebody wrote to Abby. You remember Dear Abby? And she wrote, Dear Abby, I am 44 years old and would like to meet a man my age with no bad habits. <laughs> Abby wrote back, Dear Rose, so would I. <laughs> Don't look for somebody perfect. And thank God the other person is looking for somebody perfect or they certainly won't find you. Amen? There is nobody perfect. Look for character. Now, I want to, to look at 2 Samuel chapter 13 for a moment because in 2 Samuel, and we don't have time to dig deeply into that chapter, so don't think I'm going to go into all the, the essentials there. Boy, that's a passage worth preaching on all by itself. But in 2 Samuel chapter 13, the story is about Prince Amnon, King David's son, a man who had no car. He was devoid of character. And yet I believe there are some lessons we can learn. And, and so this morning, I, wanna, I want to grab, as we talk about character, you're looking for somebody with Christianity, you're looking for someone with character, what three lessons can we learn? Number one, we can learn that it is, you are looking for someone who can control their vessel. 
Someone who is willing to wait until marriage to have sex. You say, Brother Brian, are you crazy? Those days are over. It's a, it's a pity that so many Christians are shocking up these days. I'm not talking about in our church, but as you, you, know, you know that in Christian circles, a lot of people are shocking up. And, and sadly, some are not living together. But I, I'll be frank, and I hope you understand my vernacular and won't be offended if I say that some sisters are giving up the milk, although the brother hasn't bought the cow. <laughs> I think you understand what I'm talking about. St. Augustine, we know in our Sunday school class this morning, uh, one of the, uh, somebody shared this quotation from St. Augustine before, because before he got committed to Christ, St. Augustine prayed. So, no, no, he, 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 yes, he actually prayed. Lord, make me celibate, but not just yet. <laughs> and somehow there are some Christians who have that concept. Lord, make me celibate, but not just yet, because I still want to do my thing. But I want you to understand, my friend, that God has something to say about sex. Can we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Keep your, you're still keeping your finger there in 2 Samuel, because we'll eventually get back there. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and this is a very powerful verse of Scripture, one that is worth underlining. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses number 3 to 8, and the Word of God says, It is good... It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body, or as some versions put it, his own vessel, in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction, don't, don't miss his part, are you still alive? awake? Everybody still awake? He says, therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. And so the, the injunction here is, is about how we should behave and control our vessel. Let, let, let me make it very, very clear. Parents, 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 even if you yourself had problems in that area of your life, know that you have children. Because here's the problem we make. We say, oh, but you know, I, I was weak in that area, so how dare me talk to my children about doing it God's way. Yes, even if you were weak in that area, you still share God's word. Are you trying to tell me because you may have been a thief and you see your child stealing you don't talk to the child about stealing. Come on. You will tell the child about stealing. So why can't we just because we had challenges in this area ourselves. We still have to teach what the word of God says. Because listen, failing to control our vessel before marriage is a big deal. Listen, number one. If we don't control ourselves in this area, someone is likely to get hurt. Verse number 6 tells us there of that passage. Verse number 6 points out to us that someone is taking advantage of the other. Did you see that? In this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. Listen, listen. This matter results in somebody usually getting hurt. Girls, listen. You are usually the one who gets hurt. For the life of me, I cannot understand. Oh boy, I wish I had more time. But for the life of me, sometimes I don't understand that a young lady has a relationship with a young man. She gets pregnant. He disappears. She is left holding the bag. Another guy comes along. The same thing happens again. God. 
God says that someone is likely to get hurt. Somebody is taking advantage of somebody. But second, listen, one of the problems with this, it, it blinds us in relationships. You see, too many people mistake lust for love. Cheryl and I had a wonderful friend growing up, and I, and I tell you, she had a, a sexual relationship with a young man, and the next thing she knows, she found herself so in love with this man. Man wasn't saved. After she married him for love, it was really lost. He beat her. He tried to get her on drugs. He went to jail, and if you ever knew how this wonderful, this girl, I tell you, her chauffeur would pull up with her. Oh, this is, this is how she lived. Her parents, she lived, they were among the wealthiest people I knew, loved, their parents loved Jesus, she loved Jesus. This thing can blind you. You make mistakes. But thirdly, it may cause issues with trust. If someone cannot control their vessel before marriage, there is always that concern. Is the person controlling their vessel now? So guess what God is saying? Young person, God is saying, wait. Now if you went to a gas station, if you went to a gas station and the gas pumps were busy and um, the diesel fuel was available, <laughs> would you say, I don't want to wait, I'm going to put some diesel? <laughs> you, know, you know you wouldn't do that? Because diesel fuel is made for diesel engines. Am I right about that? Brother Herb, I don't know much about mechanics, but I know that diesel is not made for my gasoline engine. And so, of course, here, here I, I actually went online and Googled this. I don't know why this idea popped into my mind. I went up online and I Googled it. Yeah, they said, if you pump diesel into gasoline, it may work for a while, but it's not going to work properly, and it can do serious damage to your car. So listen, some of you, some of you may be messing around and thinking things are working. I Trust me, it ain't working as good as you think. But it can do long-term harm. You see, sex is made for marriage. Did you get that? Do I need to say that again? Sex is made for what? For marriage. Young person, don't ever forget that. Don't make them talk you into it at school. It is made for marriage. So you know what the internet told me? It said, so if by accident, if by accident you pump diesel into your gas engine, in case any of you do that, I'll just give you a little two tip right now. Here's what they say to do. Stop! <laughs> Call the tow truck and let them tow your car to the nearest repair shop. If you are involved in sex outside of marriage, stop and get towed to the nearest repair shop. <laughs> you say, Brother Brian, what are you talking about? <coughs> listen, 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 listen. The Bible has set standards. But listen. Here is what makes me excited to be a Christian. The Bible who sets the standards is the same Bible who tells us this God who has set the standards is the same God who has provided a way of forgiveness to all those of us who breaks the standards. Aren't you happy about that? 
You see, my friend, if you're here this morning and you say, oh, Brother Brian, this message, if, if I have only heard this message some time ago, I would have been doing it differently. Listen, you're hearing it now. And God is saying, yes, you might have broken the standard, but he's saying you don't have to keep breaking the standard. You can stop right now and get a toll to his repair shop because God is in the repairing business. Amen. Can anybody, can anybody know what I'm talking about? Are we talking about a God who is in the repair business? And this God says, come, come, come. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So my friend, you may have broken the standard. It doesn't matter that you have. It does matter. But here's the good news. You can get a repair job. You can get, he'll pump out the diesel. And put you right again. But you need to make a decision. And so here we go to Amnon in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Can we go to 2 Samuel 13 as the countdown moves ahead, as our clock moves ahead. But 2 Samuel chapter 13. And we find that Amnon tells his, he wanted his, his half sister so badly that the, the Bible says he got sick. He was almost to the point of sickness because he, what? Love. Was it, was it really love? I told you, I told you, love and lust can get so confused. Girls, don't fall for these guys who tell you how badly he need you. Oh, I'll go crazy. I remember when we were, we, there was a magazine, when we were teenagers, there was a magazine called Caribbean Challenge. And I, sometimes it would have a letter too. I don't remember who the, you'd write these letters. And I remember reading one of the letters. And this young fellow, he's writing and he said, I, I think I'm going to go mad if I don't have sex. I, I think I'm going to go mad. Girls, if a guy comes to you and tells you he's going to go crazy if you don't have sex, tell him you'll make the appointment with the asylum for him. <laughs> Offer to help him out. If you love me, you would. If you love me, baby, 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 if you really love me. <laughs> That's, whenever you hear that, you know he don't love you. He love himself. He's having a lust problem. I, I, I hope... I'm trying to be as practical as I can. I, I hope you're listening to what God is trying to get across. Here's the tragedy. Here is the tragedy in verse number 15. And you, re you heard it read. What a tragedy. Did, did, it, did it try to shock you what Amnon did after he'd had sex with her? Did, did it sort of jolt you? After all of this effort... My, 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 after all of this effort, he finally has sex with this lady. And the next thing he does, the Bible says he hated her more than he had ever loved her. And he says, get lost. I know what a tragedy we have seen. I mean, I, I, am, I, am I the only one who, whose heart is broken because you have seen this so many times? Have you seen it? Where somebody has used somebody else. The, 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 I just shared with you that you, somebody takes advantage of somebody. And I want you to know, wake up. There are people out there, young person. Some people are trying to take advantage of you. And listen, woe to you if you're the one trying to take advantage of somebody else. Listen, God wants us to stay pure in this area. And young ladies... Let me just say one thing before I move on. Young ladies, if you're looking for a guy who knows how to control his vessel, be careful how you advertise on social media. I couldn't believe it. So, you know, I, I'm, folks would like to show me what's going on out there. I can't believe that the, some Christians... Christian young ladies are advertising 
in underwear? What type of guy do you think you are going to get? Come on now, wake up. What type of young man are you going to get if you advertise yourself in such a way? And my friend, listen, this is a big thing. If you are looking for a man that is really going to make sense, listen, the problem is that sometimes we don't realize marriage is for keeps. You're looking for a man who is really going to make, help you, oh my goodness. And the big character, character. Number one, a man, a person who can control their vessel. Number two, someone who knows how to honor their parents. And Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2 tells us, honor our parents that our lives may be long and it may be well with us. Listen, that's part of character. Amnon showed total disrespect for his father. Do you see what Amnon did? He played him. And if you're here this morning and you're a young person and you like to play your parents. Oh, I, I, I'm talking to, to some folks who are not even old enough to get married. But I hope you're listening. If you're one of those who like to play your parents, play these games on them, you better stop. Because the Bible says that God is actually honoring those who honor their parents. You know, it has been well said, young ladies, eh, one of the ways to, to know how a young man will treat you, one of the ways is to see how he treats his mother. And that, I believe, is true. But I would say it's good to see how he treats his parents. And guys, you look how a girl treats her parents. If this girl is always ha -ha -ha arguing with her parents and she has no respect for her, parent, her parents, I have a strong feeling she ain't gonna have a lot of respect for you either. These are markers that we must pay attention to. God does not put these things in his Bible for nothing. So it's good sometimes, you know, I always, I always think that young people who are dating and they never want to ever hang around with other people, the, the, the parents of the bad idea. You hear what I'm saying? You better hang out with them a little and see what goes on. Amen? Third, somebody with integrity. Proverbs 11 verse 3 tells us the integrity of the upright will guide them, but the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. Oprah Winfrey said, real integrity is doing the right thing. Knowing that nobody's going to know whether you did it or not. You heard that? Real integrity is doing the right thing. Knowing that nobody is going to know whether you did it or not. A person of integrity seeks to do the right thing even when no one is watching. Are you a person of integrity? How can you identify integrity? I am going to suggest two things from the same sub-passage. Oh, I'm sure there's more to it. But all our time allows us is to, as we consider this story, two ways to identify integrity from this story. Number one, look at how they behave when things aren't going their way. Never miss that. Look at how they behave when things aren't going their way. Do you, do you notice how Amnon was devious? A, a, a person with, if you're in a relationship with somebody and things aren't going their way and the plan you hear, they're telling you what lie they're going to tell and what, what underhanded thing they're going to do and what trick. Look out. Because, listen, one of the things about integrity, it shows up. You see, when things are going great, most of us are okay. The challenge is, is when things are not going your way. And I'm suggesting, young person, look at how they behave when things are not going their way. But secondly, look at their friends. 
Proverbs 13, 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer what? Will suffer harm. And you can't go through the story in 2 Samuel 13 without missing that problem with Amnon. He had some no good friends. And this man said to him, you know what you do? Lie to your dad. What type of friends you have? Young, young, young person. Come on now. What, what type of friends you have, you're holding on to? Are, are your friends the type of friends that would inspire you and encourage you to do right? The third, compatibility. Christianity, character, compatibility. Proverbs 12, 26, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Listen, number one, I'm going to run through some of these very quickly. Number one, under this area, temperament. Is this person easily angered? Proverbs 21, 19 tells us it is better. <laughs> it is better to dwell where? Read it out for me. It is better to dwell where? In the wilderness done with who? Guys, you hear that? If you marry a woman who has an anger problem, King Solomon is telling us it is better to live out in the wilderness. It's pretty bad. But listen, girls, Proverbs 22, 24 warns you, make no friendship with a man given to anger. You hear that? Don't make any friends with him or go with a wrathful man. And boy, we could give you some stories if we have the time of what happens and instances we have seen over the years of in, indivi with, with individuals marry people with anger problems. Now listen, if you're here, if you're here and you have an anger problem, you see, this, is not, this message is not just for folks with anger, who are getting married or whatever. This is for all of us. And those of us, present company included, who have problems with anger, we cannot continue to say, this is how I am. Because we need to change. Amen? We need to change. But secondly, lifestyle. If you're a world traveler, think twice about marrying the couch potato. I, I just don't understand. Some of these things seem so logical. But, but I, 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 I run into all these spouses. They're so frustrated because they want to go places and their husband it's usually the husband, by the way. <laughs> guys, guys, why don't, why don't you all... I, I, I hope you're not one of them couch potato husbands who won't do anything with his wife. But you know, a lot of the guys were like that before he got married. So if you want to be all over the place, don't marry somebody who the only thing he wants to do is sit down before the TV. Amen? So look at the lifestyle. Some, you know, some people go on vacations every year. Some go three, four, five vacations a year. But they've never gone with their spouse. No, let me stop there before I go on. I got I got since I go there, I may as well continue. You're all going to have to give me an extra five minutes this morning. Guys. Since you are you many times the problem, or ladies, if you are the problem, you got to change. If you want to save your marriage, you have got to change. You cannot say, she wants to be a world child, but I just want to watch TV. If you stay there, you are going to put your marriage in trouble. You've got to do things together. Somebody say amen. amen. And you can change. You can change. 
If she says, can we go for a little, uh, to watch a movie up in, uh, a show up in New York, you can say, oh yes, honey. Even if it, you know, you don't have. I remember my dear wife wanted to go watch one of these things. I had absolutely no interest in the thing. I went as a sacrificial lamb. <laughs> it's okay. Did I die? I think I'm still here. Can I be honest with you? Because I, 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 I didn't tell her the truth, but I was really thinking, okay, I can catch up on my sleep in this one. <laughs> I was fascinated. Believe it. I thought it was going... You see, sometimes we, we are so convinced what it's going to be like. How do you know what it's going to be like until you're there? <laughs> no, admittedly, there was another one I went to somewhere else. <laughs> I was going to catch up on my sleep, and I did. <laughs> that one had, in the middle of the play, there was a loud, there was an earthquake, and I almost, I almost died of a heart attack, because in the middle of my deep sleep, this big earthquake hit, and I was, <laughs> let's get back to the message. Third, chemistry. Chemistry, temperament, lifestyle, chemistry. You know, you can see them on TV now. She's kissing, and you, you ever notice when they kiss? What happens? <laughs> you ever notice it? The kiss is so good, the leg goes up. <laughs> no. Huh? The chemistry I'm talking about, listen, 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 listen. The chemistry we're talking about this morning is not so much the kissing. Because I honestly believe we get lost there. Here is the challenge. Too many young people are having relationships and they have no idea if they really enjoy each other's company. Did you know that? So you get married and suddenly you realize every time the man talks, you wish he'd shut up. <laughs> by, by the way, folks, I'm, I'm not talking about what I believe. I'm talking about what I know because people have come for counseling and have shared these challenges. They wish the man would keep quiet. And I'm saying to you, the problem is that too often we are so into this other stuff, this romance and all of this stuff, that we don't, we, don't, we don't focus on the real thing. Now how do you, one of the best ways, by the way, it is to find out whether you enjoy the man's company, is not to always be by yourself. Did you know that? Do things with others. Do things with others. When you do things with others, it makes you hear, is there anything between the two ears? You hear their opinions. You see how they behave. You see if they have any humor. You see if the animal will come out. <laughs> and this way you have an opportunity to get feedback. And then finally, before I bring this, Try and wrap up here. Watch for baggage. Watch for baggage. Watch if there's an unstable family life. Trust me, the children that the person has is an issue. Trust me, whether his, his mom is Jezebel is an issue. Trust me. These are issues. Does it mean that love cannot overcome all of this? No, it doesn't mean that. But you've got to factor it in. You've got to factor it in and make sure that you are aware that these are the challenges you face and you can deal with it. An unstable family life, but finally, make sure, listen, one of the biggest baggage, another living spouse. Some of you will argue with that point. We'll talk about that two weeks from now. We're going to talk about divorce and remarriage in a couple of weeks. But suffice it to say, oh, I know people will argue all they want. Here's what I know. 
The statistics show that the rate of divorce for people who were previously married, or let's put it this way, a person who is divorced and remarried has a, the rate of their divorce is twice as high as the person who has never been divorced before. Do you hear what I'm saying? You better believe that if somebody is divorced, it acts another layer of complexity. Final point, commitment. Fourth, fourth C, in Proverbs 16, 3, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Choose a person willing to make and keep commitments. You know, some folks don't know how to make commitments. Some don't know how to keep commitments. I had a friend, still have a friend. She dated a guy for five years, and then she got engaged. And she was engaged to him for 13 years. <laughs> and after investing 18 years in this relationship, he walked away. Young people, older people, make sure it's a person, Christianity, character, compatibility, commitment. Somebody who is willing to make a commitment. And there are signs all along. A person who is willing to commit to God. And a person who is willing to commit to love. And to loving one person. But do you know I found that one of the areas that is the hardest for people to make commitments in? You want to hear? The most difficult area of commitment is in the area of being willing to commit to God. Do you know, do you know that in this very sanctuary there are individuals who have come over and over and over again who know they need to make a commitment to God? Who, who, who have heard the message that Jesus Christ died for their sins? Who know that if they die without salvation, they're going to hell? Who know that Jesus can turn their life for good? Do you know that there are people like that who have come? And perhaps there's somebody here this morning like that. You have heard the message, but you have never made the commitment. I am finding that the area that people are the most reluctant to make commitments is when it comes to making a commitment to God. My friend, this morning I'm going to ask you to make that commitment. I'm going to ask you to open your heart to God and say, God, I thank you that Jesus died for my sin. And yes, I've been running from the commitment, but today I am willing to make a commitment to you. Are you going to do that? Close your eyes, bow your heads right now. Father, help that person who needs to make that commitment to do it right now. My friend, your head is bowed, your eye is closed. The Spirit of God is saying, why not make the commitment? You've been running away, you put it off, you put it off, you put it off. Do it now. I wonder if there's somebody here who will say, pray for me, Brian. I'm, I'm making that commitment today. If that's you, raise your hand right now. Don't, don't, don't put it off. Don't worry about who may see you. If you want to trust Jesus Christ today, and you need to make this commitment, would you raise your hand right now? By raising your hand, you're saying, pray for me. I am making that commitment. Is there somebody like that? Young person or an older person? Raise your hand right now. I'm making the commitment to God. Anybody like that? I'm making that commitment to God. Probably you're here this morning, and as you've listened, you realize, you know, I, I'm so thankful that I have this God who sets standards, but he has made a way of forgiveness when I break the standards. You, you probably listen, you're saying, boy, I, I have broken some of God's standards, but I want to go a different way. Why don't you talk to God this morning? Talk to God. Let him know that you are recommitting your life to him. Let him know how sorry you are for the mistakes you have made, for the sins you have committed. 
ask him to forgive you he will and then make a commitment to go a new way perhaps some of you need to make a commitment this morning God I'm facing a challenge I'm in a relationship I need to end will you help me father help these who are challenged by you to make decisions that will have value in eternity for Jesus sake amen